So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 19th Flavor of the Month CME series by Dr. Agarwal's. I am Dr. Harshal Shah. I am a FACO and Vitoratina consultant at Dr. Agarwal's Hospital, Gachigoli. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Agarwal's clinical board and Dr. Preeti Ma'am for successfully conducting the CME programs online. All the previous episodes are available at uh, our YouTube channel uh, named Dr. Agarwal's Clinical Education. And yes, this episode will also be shortly made available. So the topic for today, uh, as this being a diabetic uh, uh, month, is uh, on the surgical manner of uh, diabetic retinopathy. So diabetic retinopathy is a leading cause for visual impairment in the uh, working age individuals. Uh, the treatment options available today, uh, starting from panretinal photocoagulation to the anti-VEGF therapy with the newer and better anti-VEGFs available, uh, uh, are uh, to stop the progressions. But uh, still, nonetheless, uh, complications of diabetic retinopathy still warrant uh, surgical management in most cases. So to discuss on the same, we have uh, two very uh, senior vitro retina consultants uh, uh, with vast experience in the field. Our panelist, uh, Dr. Sunil Sir, he is the head of the head clinical service of uh, Davangiri Netralaya, a unit of Dr. Agarwal Sai Hospital, Davangiri, Karnataka. He has done his fellowship in FACO and vitro retina uh, fellowship from uh, Shankar Netralaya, Chennai. He has also been trained in ocular oncology and uh, cornea in the United States of America. Uh, he is the past uh, scientific committee chair, uh, chairperson and the past joint secretary for the uh, Karnataka Ophthalmic uh, Society. He is more than having more than 50 presentations to his credit and is uh, a reviewer for many of the Indian and international journals, uh, prominent journals. Uh, speaker for Today is Dr. Sachin, sir. He is the head of uh, uh, Netra Darshan Eye Hospital, a unit of Agarwal Sai Hospital in Belgao. Uh, he has done his retina fellowship from Shankar Netra, Chennai. And his uh, fields of interest are uh, diabetic retinopathy, ROP, and AMD. I would uh, request Dr. Sachin, sir, to start with the talk. Yeah, so uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for uh, having me on this uh, meeting. So um, I believe this uh, meeting is generally for uh, general ophthalmologists and few retina surgeons. So I'll try to make it very simple. You know, the topic is surgical management of diabetic retinopathy. So, um, so I'll be discussing, I'll be going through uh, the topic in three different uh, topics, like what are the indications of, uh, uh, you know, what, what are the surgical indications in diabetic retinopathy and what are the pharmacotherapy aided surgery, what we usually do, how do we do, and what are the tools and techniques in our uh, armamentarium to manage surgical, uh, surgically diabetic, uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So what are the evolving concepts when we uh, see a case of uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy are like we tend to uh, err towards more early vitrectomies nowadays. Uh, if you see a fibrovascular proliferation and vitreous hemorrhage, um, uh, both together, even though it's fresh and you know the fibrovascular proliferation is causing some traction somewhere and causing recurrent bleeding. So we we, we usually go in for uh, early vitrectomy. So the evolving concepts are in better in instrumentation of vitreous surgery, intraoperative visualization, uh, newer techniques for better understanding of vitromacular um, yeah, you know, indications, vitromacular diseases, vitromacular tractions, and uh, vitromacular interface by uh, OCT. Uh, and anti anti vegf aided surgeries have become very, uh, you know, uh, helpful for vitreoretinal surgeons because this reduces the vascularization completely and, you know, we can operate uh, in, a, in a very good uh, bloodless uh, field. So, coming to the indications, uh, as we all know, if there is a recurrent vitreous hemorrhage, uh, it's definitely an indication for uh, vitrectomy. And if the vitreous hemorrhage is too thick and uh, very dense, uh, like this case, what you are seeing on the screen, uh, the vitreous hemorrhage is totally uh, long-standing and then you can start, which is already decolorized and it's looking like yellowish uh, uh, exudates. So these are definitive indications wherein uh, we would um, go in for uh, vitrectomy. 
or if there is a pre retinal hemorrhage very dense pre retinal hemorrhage especially the subhyoid hemorrhage which usually doesn't resolve even if you do the laser or whatever uh, mode of treatment you uh, take it usually trapped on the macular area the sub retinal uh, the pre retinal hemorrhage so those those are the definitive indications again uh, so any form of uh, long standing vitreous hemorrhage recurrent vitreous hemorrhage and a dense pre macular hemorrhage uh, especially in the subhyoid space is a definite indication for diabetic vitrectomy so uh, what are the other indications other indications are tractional uh, detachments traction involving or threatening the macula, if there's a combined retinal detachment, if there's severe fibrovascular proliferation. The other indication which we have added recent few uh, re recent days because of better understanding of the macular uh, anatomy by OCT are vitromacular tractions, macular holes, uh, tractional diabetic papillopathies. All these are you know indications which will um, compel us to go in for vitrectomy. Other indications are like dense asteroid helices. If you see very dense asteroid helices, you'll not be able to do laser and you will be missing a lot of uh, clinical features, especially the NVE, uh, fibrovascular proliferation or even the macula. So that's one of the indication uh, for uh, vitrectomy. If you see early NVG or enterohyoid proliferation, then you can definitely take in for a uh, vitrectomy. So this is a case uh, uh, which uh, we had seen a few years back. Uh, it's a macular edema with a taut poster highlight. You can see the ILM strides in these cases. So these are the cases which won't respond to any sort of anti vegfs or how many anti vegfs you give. These are definite cases for a vitrectomy. Like this was the OCT of the patient. You can see there's a lot of traction on the macular edema causing cystoid spaces and possibly a lamellar hole. So these are the newer indications and they, uh, the results with these uh, vitrectomy are definitely better uh, uh, in such cases. And we may have to give anti vegf post vitrectomy to resolve the macular edema. Coming to the tractional retinal detachment, uh, if the tractional retinal detachment is involving the macular, macular area, then it is a definitive indication we should go ahead. If it is not involving the macular area, extra macular uh, TRD, what we call, the risk of macular involvement is only 14% per year. So it may, may, may not progress as, as much as we think so. So we can still do some laser watch, laser watch. If the macula is not detached, we should uh, we can definitely watch. Or if the tractional detachment size is more than 18%, like uh, more than four disc diameter, then the, pro then the progression is very high up to 30%. Then you can actually think of doing a vitrectomy and releasing the traction in such cases. So, uh, especially when you're attempting a surgery for tractional detachment, we should know the prognosis. We should know which case we are going to take for surgery because if there's a long-standing detachment, the retina will be very thin and atrophic. You end up creating a lot of breaks and the bleed. So, all these lead to a very bad prognosis. Uh, if the optic neuropathy is there, if you're seeing a very pale disc and a good macula, then definitely... Uh, it's not, uh, we should not attempt a surgery. Sclerosed vessels give you an indirect clue that the blood circulation to the optic nerve head and the macula will not be good whatsoever. Your anatomical success must be very good, but the functional uh, visual recovery may not be really great. So what are the indications for early vitrectomy? In type 1 diabetics, uh, we usually tend to do early vitrectomy because the progression in these cases is very fast and it can lead to combined retinal detachment and tractional detachments very soon. Um, the presence of early rubiosis is definitely an indication for uh, vitrectomy to en enable retinal ablations and to reduce the risk of NVG and if not operated. If the fellow eye status is bad, like if he's already lost a K, uh, eye because of uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and if this eye has a vitreous hemorrhage or a TRD, you tend to go in for early surgery. Uh, if there's a bilateral vitreous hemorrhage, then obviously ambulation of the vision patient is very important. We need to operate early and uh, get his ambulatory vision back. And if there's a presence of retinal detachment, any form of retinal detachment, especially the combined retinal detachment, we generally don't wait. If there's a combined retinal detachment, which is not involving the macula also, we go ahead with the uh, vitrectomy and uh, additional procedures. So coming to pharma pharmacotherapy-aided surgery, nowadays what we are doing is we tend to give anti-VEGF injections around three to four days prior the surgery. Like in cases with high, very uh, thick fibrovascular proliferation in whom we expect a lot of bleeding and uh, 
uh, you know, um, uh, very aggressive proliferative retinopathy. We tend to give three to four days prior um, anti VEGF. Uh, fitness has to be obtained because you cannot cancel the surgery once you have given anti VEGF injection. Because if you cancel the surgery, the you know the proliferation tends to become very hard, taut, and it's very difficult for it to uh, for us to operate later on. It's called the crunch effect of anti VEGFs. So medical fitness need to be obtained beforehand before giving the anti VEGF. Some pe some people are using dexamethasone implant in very high risk PDR. It's injected in the vitreous base, which reduces the inflammation, better post op control of inflammation, and reborn neovascularization is uh, is reduced in some cases. It also works well very well under the oil. So what are the tools and techniques we have now? Uh, in the recent days, you know, we during vitrectomy we have a smaller gauge vitrectomy. There's a lot of uh, improvement in the cutter technologies. We have walled cannulas basically to uh, prevent uh, regurg and the bleed during uh, intraoperatively. We have wide angle viewing system, which are HD viewing system. We have 3D viewing systems. The the light source of the vitrectomy is pretty good. Uh, it is uh, it's it's we can use a chandelier light to do a bimanual surgery. So all these are recent advances in the vitreoretinal surgery, which help a vitreoretinal surgeon to manage a very complex uh, uh, macular detachment or combined retinal detachment and to deal with a lot of membranes. So as I said, we are going for smaller and smaller uh, gauge vitrectomies. It's transconjunctival usually. Uh, we don't open the conjunctiva and self sealing wound is created. Uh, the cut rates have improved from 5,000 to 10,000 cut rates. We can move very close to the retina. The functional, the functional multifunction cutters are there now. We don't use much of scissors or forceps. In most of the cases, we can get away with only the cutter and the port is optimized so very well so that we can go very close to the retina and operate them, uh, operate on the membranes. Now, the intraopacity has been recently added, and this is a very expensive tool to have in your OR, but it's definitely a useful tool to understand the intraoperative macular uh, anatomy, especially if you are operating on a macular, uh, you know, vitromacular interface, wherein uh, there's a lot of VMT or a vitromacular adhesion. So you'll know whether you're creating a hole or you're creating some traction on the retina. This is definitely an added uh, tool. So, uh, these are very technical aspects of vitreoretinal surgery, wherein uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, come a long way from 20 gauge to 23 gauge and 25 and 27 gauge vitrectomies. So basically what is important in vitreoretinal surgery, especially when you are handling the membranes, is to identify the plane of the membrane. So these, um, the plane of the membrane is so important because most of these are something like a tabletop membranes, like it will have a uh, edges below the uh, you know uh, the table like you know it, it will be like a conical shape as you can see in the surgical video which i'm uh, playing there so i didn't it's not only the membrane which we can pull easily so these membranes are dissected for after this after finding the right plane if you are in the right plane the bleeding also is less then we segment them into a small pieces uh, using the cutter see this cutter is uh, functioning as a multifunctional a cutter wherein I'm not using any scissor, I'm just going behind the membrane with the um, cutter itself and uh, segmenting it into small pieces and then um, uh, dissecting and removing all the membranes. So this is another surgical case, uh, surgical video I wanted to show, like this is a case wherein uh, this is a vitreous hemorrhage, complete vitreous hemorrhage, I'm trying to do a core vitrectomy. Um, trying to clear all the vitreous hemorrhage. Once we clear the vitreous hemorrhage, this is a subhyoid hemorrhage which is coming on. We call something called a uh, you know truncation of the cone. Like we enter the posterior hyoid and all the subretinal uh, subhyoid hemorrhage comes in the cutter, and it clears up, and then you'll have a view of the retina very uh, quickly. So after doing a core vitrectomy, we'll be tackling the membranes now. If you see, uh, the membranes are very adherent, and the underlying retina is very thin. If you can uh, notice that I'm trying to create a cleavage between the mem between the posterior hyaloid and the retina. This technique is called uh, proportional reflex. I'm using a hydro dissection. The cutter itself will push the water below the membranes so that uh, we, we get a good plane of uh, dissection. See now, once I get that's the posterior hyaloid which is attached, which is attached to the membrane itself. 
So once we get the cleavage of the plane, things become very easy. Now, this, this is a part which I wanted to show you how close we can go to the retina because the cutter technology is so, so very well advanced that you can not, we could not imagine going so close to the retina in cases of 20 gauge vitrectomy. Now you can see I, I'm, I'm trying to peel all the membranes on the retina going very close, activating the cutter and uh, suction at the same time. So the cutter has become, the cutter, vitreous cutters have become a multifunctional cutters and we, we can manage most of the cases without using a scissor or a bimanual dissection. In very bad cases, of course, we resort for a bimanual dissection, uh, which probably I'll show you sometime later when we discuss. So, so once we uh, remove all the membranes uh, and clear almost all the membranes, like in this case, you can see, the subretinal hemorrhage was there. We are clearing the subretinal hemorrhage through a retinotomy. Once the subretinal hemorrhage is cleared, we lasered the break and then put a oil inside. So this is how the vitreoretinal surgery has, uh, you know, progressed in recent years. So this is just an algorithm wherein you have active PDR. If there's a vitreous hemorrhage, observe for one to two months, depending on the case wise. If it is non-clearing, go ahead with the uh, vitrectomy. If it is non-operative, then do a PRP or an anti vegf injection and then uh, try to uh, regress the membranes uh, if it is uncomplicated. If you have a TRD and if it is peripheral, you can you can just non you can just watch the patient for a few months and then keep them under regular follow-up till it progresses. If you see the progression of TRD or if there is a recurrent uh, which is hemorrhage along with the TRD, you can go ahead with the vitrectomy. TRD involving the macula, if there is a severe fibroscular proliferation, then definitely you have to go ahead with the um, uh, vitrectomy and uh, additional procedures as required. The whole idea is to release as much as traction on the retina possible to reduce the fibroscular proliferation on the, on the retina and to reduce the VEGF load by doing a, a good vitrectomy. Uh, so that the proliferative diabetic retinopathy becomes quiescent. So the take-home message from my talk should be, you know, nowadays with better uh, instrumentation, especially uh, the small luggage vitrectomies and anti vegf aided surgery, the surgical results are very nice, very great. Um, uh, uh, visual recovery is uh, very good. Uh, better understanding of vitromacular um, uh, interface uh, by OCT has widened the scope of predictable results. Early surgery uh, makes it easier, and you know, with the visual, uh, with the better visual results. Thank you so much, everyone, for your patient hearing.